Good evening, everyone. Welcome tonight to tonight's regular school board meeting. It is December 12th, 2017, and the time is 6.03 p.m. Uh, seated from my left to my right before you tonight is Director Fortner, Director Douglas, Director Ostafi, myself, Director Gerhardt, Director Burgett, Director Craig, and Superintendent of Schools, Dr. McGuire. Would you all stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board members, uh, in front of you is the agenda as it's been uh, printed. Are there any additions to the agenda? Seeing none, I would move that we accept the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second by Director Ostafi. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? With that, the agenda is accepted. Uh, next up on our agenda is the Truth and Taxation Hearing and Public Comment. Patricia Magnuson. Good evening. This is the school board's public hearing for taxes payable in 2018. The presentation is designed to inform our taxpayers about the school district budget and the tax levy in compliance with Minnesota state law, which requires that school districts hold a public meeting on the proposed tax levy with very specific time requirements and with very specific content requirements. In order to accomplish the state requirements, tonight's hearing agenda will include background information on the district's fiscal year 2018 budget, along with actual financial results for fiscal year 2017. This will be followed by information on the district's proposed tax levy for taxes payable in 2018. At the end of the presentation, the public will have the opportunity to provide comment. First, I will provide some background information about public school funding. The Minnesota State Constitution includes the duty of the legislature to establish a system of public schools. The local property tax levy is one of the mechanisms that the state legislature uses to fund public education. As a result, public school funding is highly regulated and revenue formulas, tax policy, and the tax levy process are established through state law. A key point about the tax levy is that increases or decreases in the local levy do not necessarily translate into changes in the school district's budget. State-determined formulas and voter approval create limits for the tax levy. Some increases are offset by reductions in state aid, and expenditure budgets are limited by and established through a separate process. An increase in school taxes does not always correlate to an increase in the expenditure budget. Now I will review the fiscal year 2018 budget. Because school district fiscal years run from July 1st through June 30th, tonight we will review the current year's budget, which ends on June 30th, 2018. The tax levy that is being considered this evening will provide revenue for next year's budget beginning on July 1st, 2018. The school district budgets within several different funds as listed on this slide. The budget for the majority of the K-12 operations lies within the first fund on the list, the general fund. This chart, showing fiscal year 2017 actual year-end results and the fiscal year 2018 adopted budget amounts, was published in the newspaper and is posted on the district's website. This is a required publication and it is included here for information only. This pie chart shows Osseo Area Schools projected revenue for all funds. The budgeted revenue for fiscal year 2018 is over $334 million. I will provide detail on the blue portion of the chart, the General Operating Transportation Fund, which makes up approximately 79% of the budget. This chart shows the revenue sources for the General Operating Transportation Fund. As shown on the previous chart, this fund makes up 79% of the revenue received by the school district. This fund's revenue comes from five main sources, with state aid, both general, which is the dark blue section, and special education, which is the yellow section, making up 75.4% of the revenue, and property taxes, which is the red section, 
makes up 19.1%. Federal revenues, which are the pink section, and other sources such as grants, which is green, I think you can see that it's green, make up the remaining 5.5%. This chart shows projected general fund expenditures by program. Most expenditures directly support students through regular special education and vocational instruction, instructional support and transportation services. This chart then breaks down the expenditure budget in another way by what we refer to as an object category. The projected expenditures by object category indicates that over 86% of the budget pays for people, the salaries and benefits of employees who deliver educational services and support school district operations. Education is a people-intensive industry, making this a normal pattern for school districts. We will now move on from the budget to discuss the proposed tax levy for taxes payable in 2018. Every owner of taxable property pays property taxes for various taxing jurisdictions in which their property is located, such as the county, the city, and the school district. Each taxing jurisdiction sets its own levy, often based on limits set in state law. The county, which is Hennepin County in our case, sends out bills, collects taxes from property owners, and distributes funds back to the taxing jurisdictions. This is a sample of what a property tax statement may look like, and school districts are one of the taxing jurisdictions. Each school district may levy taxes in over 30 different categories. Levy limits, or maximum levy amounts for each category, are set either by state law or through voter approval. The Minnesota Department of Education calculates detailed levy limits for each public school district. We reviewed these limits with the school board when the preliminary levy was set on September 20th and again at the November 15th work session. This is a schedule of events that established the payable 2018 tax levy. Tonight we are holding this public hearing and the board is scheduled to take action on the final levy later this evening. State law requires that we explain reasons for major increases to the overall levy. The total proposed tax levy for taxes payable in 2018 is increasing by 3.1% over taxes in 2017. This slide shows the line items of the levy within the three funds for which tax levy is a revenue component. So these funds include the general fund, which includes the capital fund for these purposes, the community service fund, and the debt service fund. So for instance, you do not see the food service fund on this slide because there is not a tax levy component for that fund's revenue. The first column of numbers shows the tax levy for each line item for last year. The second column, which is highlighted in yellow, shows the proposed tax levy for taxes payable in 2018. And the third column indicates the increase or decrease in that line item. Finally, the percentage change by fund and for the district in total is indicated in the last column. The next several slides will explain some of the line items of the levy that have increased, specifically the operating referendum, the capital projects levy for technology, long-term facilities maintenance, both in the general fund with an offsetting impact in the debt service fund, and finally, the reduction for debt excess. So first, we'll talk about the voter-approved operating referendum. This operating levy is increasing due to the formula for this line item. Our district's voter approval includes an inflationary increase, which is 2% for this year. It also includes increases due to an expected increase in student enrollment and an increase in overall property values. This formula provides funding for district general operations. The, vo the voter approved capital projects levy for technology is increasing because the district's voter approval established a tax rate applied to the district's tax base, which has increased. This formula provides funding for district capital and technology. Long-term facility maintenance revenue is decreasing in the general fund. There is a planned offsetting increase in the debt service fund, 
that was designed to maintain a level tax rate for these deferred maintenance projects. And then finally, the debt service funds levy is linked directly to scheduled principal and interest payments, which school districts are required to levy at 105% in order to cover um, delinquent taxes. And if delinquencies are less than that 5%, these funds are returned to taxpayers through a levy reduction formula that is established through the levy process. Because the reduction for taxes payable in 2018 is less than the reduction in 2017, this line item is experiencing an increase. While changes in the dollar amount of the levy provided through funding formulas can cause the tax bill for indiv individual property to increase or decrease, other factors are also involved, such as changes in the value of an individual property or changes in the overall valuation of district property. The following slides are tables and graphs showing examples of changes in the school district portion of property taxes from taxes payable from 2015 through 2018. We're trying to show a span of years. The examples were, pre were prepared by the district's financial advisors, Ellers and Associates. All examples are based on a 16.5% increase in property value over the four-year period from 2015 to 2018, including a 6.5% increase from 2017 to 18. And I'll explain all that when we get to those slides. The amounts are intended to provide a representation of what may have happened to school district property taxes over this period of time for a typical property. So first, this chart indicates several property types and values and the changes in the school taxes from 2015 through 2018. To understand this change, the most important piece of information on this table is the tax rate, which is calculated for each year. So the highlighted area in yellow, you see that yellow oval on the bottom left, it indicates the 2015 tax rate for the school district was 27.156% and 0.29426%. Now just notice the change in the tax rates over the years. So in 2016, the rate declined to 26.263 and 0.27819%. And then last year, 2017, the rates were 26.73 and 0.27516. So finally, for this year, taxes payable in 2018, rates have declined to 24.863% and 0.2656%. That's the lowest rate in the past four years. So what we're looking at here is no increase in property value on an individual parcel. This will result in reduced school district property taxes from last year. This blue bar, as an example, indicates the tax impact of a decline in, of $68 per year for a $250,000 home whose value has not changed since last year. I've spoken with taxpayers who have experienced this decline in their school taxes. Many taxpayers assessed valuation has increased since last year. This will increase the taxes paid on their property, even though the tax rate has declined. So here's some examples of that. This is a different chart. It shows the tax impact for properties whose value has increased by 16% over this four-year period, including a 6.5% increase from last year to this year, 2018. Note that the tax rate is the same. Same tax rate and declining tax rate this year. Even though the tax rate for school um, taxes has declined for taxes payable in 2018, increases in individual property values will have the impact of increasing taxes. So again, now this blue bar indicates a home whose value has grown to $250,000 since 2015. For this home, the 2018 tax impact of the proposed levy is an increase of $19 per year. Each property will have unique characteristics. I have spoken with taxpayers this year whose taxes have gone down as a result of the declining tax rate and taxpayers whose taxes have gone up. 
as a result of increases in the assessed valuation of their property. The next few slides show some examples for properties who, whose valuations have increased as, sh as shown on this page, 16% in the last four years, including a 6.5% increase this past year. So this first example, again, is a $250,000 residential property. And again, they will experience a $19 per year increase in school taxes from $1,230 for taxes payable in 2017 to $1,249 for taxes payable in 2018. Again, this assumes that the property value increased 6.5% this past year. So using that same assumption, this is a $400,000 residential property. They will experience a tax increase of $26 per year, again, assuming a 6.5% increase in their property value. Now, this is a $1 million commercial industrial property. They will experience a tax increase of $52 per year. Again, this assumes that that property value increased by 6.5%. And finally, this is a $1 million apartment property. They will experience a tax increase of $43 per year with that same 6.5% market value increase assumption. Now I will review the process to date and the next steps that will establish the tax levy for taxes payable in 2018. The levy certification process began on September 12th when the school board discussed the tax levy at its workshop. The school board discussed the levy at public meetings again on September 19th and on November 14th. And tonight, the school board will take public comment. Then later this evening, the school board is scheduled to take action to certify the final levy during its regular meeting. Staff will then cer certify the school board approved levy to the Hennepin County Auditor and to the Department of Revenue. So at this time, the board can take comments from the public. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I believe we do have one card meant for the public hearing. Mr. Ferguson, did you want to speak during this portion or during public comment for the general portion of the meeting? I think you, you might as well speak to this portion now. Okay, I gave you a copy. Uh, thanks. Uh, nice to see you, Chairman and Board. <laughs> I gave you a copy of uh, the um, budget. This is, uh, I produce this off of your website. So um, uh, there's two pages that I've given you. One has got the general fund revenue and then the, the second one is the general fund expenditure. They go both go together. Um, the property tax levy, um, yeah, look at the local source taxes, it says $53 million. Roughly 50, 50 million dollars of the of the levy is getting put into the general fund, right? So um, then, when I look at this uh, summary expenditure, I go through most of the details, and it's pretty much all um, salary and, and employee benefits. I, I calculated it to be about uh, ninety nine point nine. 3% of it was mostly salary, okay? So, um, there's several things I want to talk about here is that, okay, the levy's put into the general fund and the uh, Board of Education and the superintendent get paychecks out of the general fund. And there's some people that have taken pay increases. So, uh, So I think that you have a potential conflict of interest because you're, you're looking at uh, monies that are coming into the general budget from the uh, levy and you, you're getting money out of that uh, same fund and you're voting on something that you're making money on. So uh, under uh, Minnesota Statutes 10A Section 7 Conflict of Interest, disclosure of potential conflict, a public official or local official elected to or appointed to a metropolitan government unit who is in discharge of official duties would be required to take an action or to make a decision that would substantially affect the official's financial interest or those of the associated business. 
unless the effect of the official is no greater than one of the members in the official's business classification, profession, or occupation must take the following actions. Prepare a written statement describing the matter requiring action or decision and the nature of the potential conflict of interest. Deliver copies of the statement to the official immediate supervisor. If a member of the legislation of the governing body or the Metropolitan Government Unit, deliver a copy of the statement to the presiding officer of the body of service. Uh, it goes on to say in subdivision two that um, if there is no immediate superior, the official must abstain if possible in a manner prescribed by the board from the influence over the action of the decision in question. So I'm, I'm making a point that you're make, you guys are making money off this general fund and the levies coming into that general fund, you've got a conflict of interest. Okay. Um, so now, uh, the thing is, is I want to talk to you a little bit now is some of the verbiage going on here. Pull this up. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's about $50 million going um, in, in from the levy. And about and and then uh, the <coughs> the salaries and the uh, employee benefits are almost all of it's being spent on salary and employee benefits. That's what the levy is being used for, according to your um, budget. Okay. So the most accurate way to put that is that you people are intending to spend five hundred million dollars, and those funds are for uh, salary and employee benefits. That's the most accurate way to describe how this levy is being spent. Okay? So, when I look at the minutes conducted on July 30th, 2013, uh, I get down to a portion that says the additional revenu revenue will be used to finance school operations. Okay, this is what it says. Sco to finance school operations. Okay, so uh, there's different terms for the use operation. There's op operation uh, levy. Uh, there's a, um, oh, hold on. O operations uh, project levy uh, and uh, operation uh, capital operations um, used for uh, fixing buildings and developing new buildings, okay? But that's not what this is, is describing. It's, it's not describing school operations in that manner. Uh, when you look at the, again, at the budget, and you count up four, uh, pretty much one, two, three, four, five lines from the bottom, there's sites and buildings operations. There's $9 million being put into that budget. Now that's a $41 million discrepancy because the way you're describing it in this minutes is that it's to finance school operations. School operations is in the general budget for $9 million as a line item. And so what's happening is that this verbiage is being used as a general, as a general verbiage. So you guys are using the language the way that suits you best. And that is to uh, get this fi uh, $500 million and spend it on salaries and, um, and your benefits. When you get to the vote, this is the verbiage on the vote, okay? Uh, school district ballot question one, revoking existing referendum revenue authorization, approving new authorization. The Board of Independent School District number 279, Osseo Schools, has proposed to re revoke the school district's existing referendum revenue authorization of approximately $1,539.29 per pupil and to replace that authorization with a new authorization of $1,989.29 per pupil. The school district's actual referendum revenue for any school uh, shall not exceed the statutory maximum for that year. The proposed new referendum revenue authorized would increase each year by the rate of inflation when applicable for 10 years unless otherwise revoked or reduced as provided by law. This is how this, is how this came at us, right? So when a, when a um, voter looks at this, they see that there's going to be an increase of $400 per pupil and, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll put it to you plainly. Um, when you look at the budget and what I described, you're basically getting this money for $500 million and you're using it for 
salaries and for employee benefits. Okay, that's what it's used for. But when you look at the ballot, you're supposed to be able to understand with this verbiage, uh, the referendum revenue authorization, that that's what that money's supposed to be used for. Can you, can you uh, honestly say that you can look at that language and say that this is for $500 million and that it's for, uh, it's for uh, revenues, uh, it's for your salaries and for your employee benefits. When I look at this uh, language, I cannot, I cannot uh, justify or I cannot uh, validate that that's what that money is being used for. So these, uh, these voters are walking in to vote on this. They don't have their computers. They don't have their phones access to them. They're strictly reading this language, okay? And they're supposed to understand that there's a uh, existing referendum revenue authorization, and they're supposed to understand what that means. Does anybody know what uh, referendum re revenue authorization means? Anybody in this room know what that means? How about you guys? Do you know what that means? Yeah, okay. So, um, so then in this, uh, hold on a second. In the same paperwork, it talks about uh, referendum authorization in uh, section 126C17. So this is what a, a, a voter is supposed to rely on and understand and make sense of and make a, a reasonable decision on how they're supposed to vote on this, right? Okay, so let's look at this. Um, okay, this is the referendum revenue. So we're talking about referendum revenue um, authorization. So this is how it starts out. Subdivision one, referendum allowance. I'm gonna read just a couple sections, otherwise we're gonna be here a while. A district's initial referendum allowance equals the results of the following cal calculations. Multiply the referendum allowance the district would receive for a fiscal year 2015 under Minnesota Statute 2012, Section 126.17, Subdivision 1, based on elections held before July 1st, 2013. By the residential marginal cost pupil unit, the district would have counts for fiscal year 2015 under Minnesota Statute 2012, 126.05. Add the results of the clause uh, one, the adjustment the district would receive under Minnesota Statute 212, Section 127A, Subdivision 7, Paragraph A, B, and C, based on elections held before July uh, 2013. Divide the results of the clause by the district adjusted pupil units for fiscal year 215. And that's just a part of this. So as, as so then you're, uh, pr when a, if a regular uh, voter is trying to understand referendum revenue, what they have to do actually is go up to uh, a different section uh, down the line here quite a ways, and it's, a, uh, it's subdivision nine, referendum revenue. The revenue authorized by section 126.10, subdivision one. So this is where the, uh, this is where the author, uh, authorization comes in is 126.10. So then what we gotta do is bump up to 126.10, subdivision one, and start uh, understanding that. So now the referenda, uh, referendum revenue turns into the general education revenue. So the term changes. So let's look at how this reads. The general education revenue for each district equals the sum of the district's basic revenue, extended time revenue, gifted and talented revenue, declining enrollment revenue, local option, optional revenue, small schools revenue, basic school revenue, secondary sparsity uh, revenue, elementary sparsity revenue, transportation sparsity revenue, to total operating capital revenue, equity revenue, pension adjustments revenue, and transition revenue. So what this previous section says is that general amount, it, it just increases that general amount. It doesn't categorize what section, what I just read there, it doesn't tell you what section that goes in, it just generally raises that. So you're making an educated guess on where this money is going. Is it going into your basic revenue or is it going into your total operating capital revenue? Don't know. The, the statute just says it increases it generally. So then when you get to, uh, then there's a little bit of a conflict that creates confusion, uses of revenue. Except otherwise prohibited by law, a district may spend general fund money for capital purposes. Again, capital purposes is for fixing buildings or or buying new buildings. So when you look at this general education revenue that it's turned into, 
Now there's a conflict to understand what this, uh, where this capital money is going to. This, what I'm describing here is what the taxpayer is supposed to understand clearly when they go to the voting booth and without even being able to look it up on a computer or, or have their paperwork ready, they're supposed to read this referendum and fully understand it. Okay, so now, so then it really doesn't ex still explain how this money can be used to uh, um, pay for salaries and, and uh, educated be uh, for salary benefits, right? In those two sections, it doesn't describe it. Okay, the one thing it says is for the capital. So then, I mean, so then I, I have to jump up to another section, which is 126 C 13 general, general education aid, okay? Under the general education aid, subdivision four, it says for fiscal year 2015, a district general education aid equals the general education revenue, which I just talked about, excluding operational capital revenue, equity revenue, local optional revenue, and transitional revenue, minus the student achievement levy, multiply times the ratio of the actual amount student achievement levy, levy levied to the permitted student achievement plus. So then I'll skip down here, uses of this revenue, ex except for provided in section 126.10, subdivision 14, 126C12, and 126C115, general education revenue may be used during the regular school year and the summer for general and specific school purposes, okay? So when you get into describing the regular school year and, and general purposes, this is where you can use the money for the teachers. Uh, so essentially what you have to do is go from, uh, from your referendum revenue to your uh, general education revenue and then it gets turned into what's called general education aid. And now this, this is exactly what a tax appears, a, a voter is supposed to understand when they go to the, with this level of complexity, they're supposed to understand that in, in entirely. So now the thing is, is that the most honest way to approach the verbiage isn't to say that it's a revenue a referendum authorization, which people don't understand, what, what should be said in the ballot, should have been said in the ballot, is that you're attempting to get $500 million and that you're using that money for uh, purposes of, of um, your salary and your, your uh, benefits. I mean, that's, that's what your budget says and that's what you're doing, yet when we look at this verbiage, it's very confusing. You go through these statutes, you don't understand. Uh, you, you read this when you walk into the ballot booth and you're supposed to understand this is for $500 million. And that le I ask people, well, how much do you think this is for? Uh, 30,000, 40,000, no, $500 million. And the, the, the voter is supposed to know that from this information that we've provided. Now, when I look through and read everything to see whether it was germane, definitely. I mean, you look through and you, you jump through all those sections, sure, you can have an attorney say, yeah, well, every, everything's in place. The problem you run into is there's more than just being germane on a circumstances. The, the voter needs to understand what's going on. They need to understand what they're spending their money on, what they're getting into. So let me read you this. This is fraud in the factum. This is describing a type of fraud. Fraud in the factum is a type of fraud where misrepresentation causes one to enter a transaction without accurately realizing the risk, duties, or obligations incurred. This can be when the maker or drawer of a negotiable instrument, such as a promissory note or check, is induced to sign the instrument without a reasonable opportunity to learn of its fraudulent character or essential terms. Um, okay, so essentially, Determines the, the terminology here is essential terms, okay? The essential terms is the $500 million and that you're using it for, for your salaries and for your uh, uh, teacher benefits. So what's being presented is this, um, is this uh, referendum uh, revenue authorization. What I'm saying is that you're not describing these essential terms, the $500 million and that it's going towards your paychecks. And uh, that is a form of fraud. You're not, 
strictly and clearly defining to the voter what these terms are for and what they should expect and how much money is being allocated and what it's being used for. That terminology is crap to me, okay? So, I mean, you're, you're looking at me pursuing this where I, uh, you, you're looking at, well, the first thing was uh, by voting for this, you're, you're doing a, a conflict of interest. That's a gross misdemeanor. Uh, three uh, $3,000 one year in jail. And now, w um, when you're talking about fraud and how much money is being affected, um, the, the, the statute starts, uh, the one of the higher statutes starts at when $35,000 is taken, and the, the uh, imprisonment for that is 20 years in jail and a $100,000 fine. That's what it's for. And we're not talking about $35,000, we're talking about $500 million, okay? And, and the reason this is all coming down the pike and how this got voted on so closely is because of your verbiage, your lack of verbiage, actually. And so uh, the thing is, I've been getting a whole ton of uh, rationalizations about why this is going down and, oh, the how great teachers are and why they deserve the money and why we need to boost and there's competition and all that. And I, I say these are all uh, rationalizations that's supporting a fraud scheme. And the thing is, is that, you know, I, I've been around the block to talk about this and I want to let you know. I've been, I've talked to the Minnesota Attorney General, I've talked to the FBI, I've, uh, I've talked to the Hennepin County Auditor, uh, I've talked to the treasurer at the uh, Department of Education uh, Department. I've talked to the commissioner's office. Uh, I've talked to a board down in the St. Peter. I've, I've been on the phone and talking about this, and, and I've been up here to talk to Patricia Magnuson about this issue. So what I'm saying is that uh, the way I see it is that there, because of the verbiage and how you've approached the voter, that there's a fraud scheme going on here for $500 million, okay? And I'm serious about this. And, uh, and I am Mr. I, I'm we, looking we, into we've, this. We've well established that we, okay. we don't like the, the verbiage. I think we've been through that yeah. several oh, times by that, now. Well, I think it's necessary, sir, because it isn't, hasn't been explained in detail in the past. Mr. Chair, so. if I may. But I, I'm pretty much finished anyway. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that you folks need to take a real serious look on, at this vote on this. There's some legal implications here, and there's certain things that I'm pursuing, and I think that I have a legitimate pursuit on it. And I'm very vocal and intelligent, and I can figure this out. And I, I think you guys need to take my, my recommendations and my input into this situation seriously. And, and we will. Thank you. Chair, may, may I? Yes. Very, very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson, for your research and your Anytime. and for your time. Appreciate that. I just want to follow up and say that you know the language that appears on ballots that's set forth in state statute. It doesn't come from your local district. It's from the state, and also um, it does cost a lot of money to educate our children. And we all, I have children in the district, and I know that you said that you heard justification, but. It is a lot of money to run and educate a public educational institution. I think our ratios are very similar to surrounding districts on our op, you know, general operating budget, what we pay in salaries. It's all very similar to surrounding districts and I don't think it's out of line. And I just wanted to follow that up and thank you for your time and thank you for your research. Okay. Let me just respond to that. Um, that that's not a, a legal explanation of what's going on. That's a rationalization. And what I'm looking at is the statutes and the legal uh, ramifications around the statutes. You can talk about how great the school is all day long and how great they are, but, but you need to look at the, the legal ramifications. What do the statutes say? What, does the, what, is the vote, what did the vote say? I, is that accurate information? Are you bringing accurate information to the voter? This has nothing to do with the quality that you're offering or how expensive it is or anything like that. You cannot rationalize this. M Mr. Ferguson, to handle this th I don't believe this fashion. is rationalization. You said that you've talked to the Attorney General, the FBI, all yeah. sorts of people, all, the, all these authorities that would know. Have any of them agreed with your opinion that yeah, there's the fraud Yeah, the FBI was interested in my case. 
They had. Uh, they said I had a legitimate. Uh, they had a legitimate interest in this, well, and they, they, they took a file. I mean, as, as a citizen, I would I would encourage you to go ahead and, and pursue that as you see fit. But we well, have, what we I have what I'd rather see them, is so instead I of being instead of being inflammatory and negative, what I'd like to do is to have a honest uh, honest approach to this. That's what I'm asking for. The the pro uh, you're hurting. What you're doing is 500 million dollars. You're, you're using that money out of this whole area, and you're assuming you're entitled to that money. But that 500 million, you're taking that out of the population. These people could use 500 million dollars for a lot of other things besides education. And you're trying to ration, you're trying to justify it. But what I'm saying is that what needs to happen is there needs to be honest dialogue. You, uh, when you put something on a, re a revenue or on a referendum, you need to indicate what you're going to use that money for. Nobody has opened up and said that you're spending $500 million and that you're using it for salary and, and employee benefits. Nobody has said that. That's a dishonest approach, and you're being dishonest to the property tax owners when you approach things that way. And what I'm saying is that uh, I would ra I'd like to see a forum where people are honest, the kids are getting an honest uh, representation of this. I mean, when you break down this $500,000, each kid could get $25,000 a piece. If that money was given to each student, 22,000 population, a little more, that's $25,000. That, and what could those people use that for? They could use that for college education, clothing. They could Mr. Ferguson, I think we're getting way computers. off topic because, because you're, you're, you're getting, yes, because you're getting into subjects that are dealing with state statute. We don't control that here. So a lot of the issues that you seem to be bringing up here seem to be better addressed to your local representative. We, we don't turn that money over to people. That's not what the money is coming no, to but us. No, what I, I'm suggesting Mr. is... Mr. Ferguson, thank you. We've heard your opinion. We've heard several times repeatedly what, what you'd like to see. We've heard your issues. We've heard your... And we will sure. we'll take yeah, that into consideration. Fine. Yeah, I'm going to move to that. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers for public comment on tra truth and taxation? Okay. All right, thank you. All right, I guess that brings us to our next agenda item, which is the audience opportunity to address the school board. And we do have several cards here. <coughs> uh, we have guidelines for, oh, Patricia, did you need to wrap up something? Okay, all right, fair enough. We have guidelines for our audience opportunity to address the school board. Uh, in the interest in community engagement, the Osseo School Board provides an opportunity for members of the audience to address the board as follows. Anyone who wishes to address the board must complete a speaker card and submit it to the school board chair prior to the start of the meeting. Uh, once the audience opportunity to address the school board has begun, no additional cards will be accepted. The board chair or designee will call on each speaker who has submitted a speaker card, first calling on those addressing an item included on, in the current agenda followed by those addressing topics not on the current agenda. Speakers will be called in the following order, students, parents, guardians of students, district employees, district residents, and all others. When called upon, please state your name and topic. All remarks should be addressed to the board as a whole, not to any specific members or to any person who is not a member of the board. If more than three individuals have organized to speak on the same topic, please designate a spokesperson who can summarize the issue. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Longer time may be granted at the discretion of the board chair. During the agenda item, not normally to exceed 20 minutes, subject to the discretion of the board chair, the board and administration will listen to comments, ask clarifying questions if needed, and respond when appropriate. The board chair may delegate responsibility to the superintendent or to the superintendent's designee to follow up with the speaker within a few days of the meeting. Comments and interactions between board members and the public are expected to be respectful, courteous, professional, and civil. The board chair will be responsible for ensuring that interaction meets these standards and will disallow inappropriate interaction. In particular, speakers may not address criticism toward an individual district employee. Such concerns should be directed privately to the employee supervisor or higher level administrator. Personnel concerns should be directed to individuals in the following order. Building principal, executive director for human resources, assistant superintendent, superintendent, and finally in writing to the school board. And with that, we have our first speaker, uh, Adam Bunge. Bungie? Bungie? Well, thank you all for your service um, and for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Adam Bungie. I am a Maple Grove resident. 
uh, and a parent of a uh, former student of Weaver Lake and a current student of Weaver Lake Elementary. Um, I'm here to speak on uh, the issue of personnel, um, really the personnel of this board. Um, first of all, uh, as I said before, my name is Adam Bungie. Uh, I am an attorney. Uh, I um, am a school volunteer. I volunteer for field trips. Um, I'm a, a basketball coach. Um, proud basketball coach for a uh, basketball team um, and father of one Weaver Lake student currently. Um, I coach both girls and boys. I'm also a member of the board of uh, directors for Mobile Hope at Maple Hill Estates. Um, so one of the things I'm really concerned about is representation on the board and representation of the entire community. Um, I realize I'm at an advantage here because I live in Maple Grove and it looks like we have a, a large number, a large contingent of uh, board members that reside in Maple Grove. Um, I'm concerned about that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, it doesn't seem like the whole community is represented on this board, um, especially the members of this uh, District 279. Um, one of the reasons I'm concerned about that is I realize that could change at any time. As a Maple Grove resident, I could have nobody representing me at some point. Uh, so one of the things I'm, I'm worried about is the issue of uh, taxation without representation. Um, it seems like there's a lot of members of the community in uh, especially the eastern di part of this district that aren't necessarily represented um, by uh, members of this board. Um, I just want to make sure that that, that is brought to the the board's attention and my proposal would be is that this board examine whether the rules should change and that uh, the um, there should be a requirement that at least one member of the board be from each community in which this district uh, represents that's and again thank you for your service thank you our next speaker for the night is Abby Gust. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Abby. I went to Weaver Lake and now I go to Maple Grove Senior High. And I'm here to talk about also diversity and the way it has affected me and my schooling education in this district. So I have been in the district for a long time. I went to Weaver Lake for the STEM program and it had a lot of variety for an elementary schooler, and that was a lot of what my friends were. I was surrounded by a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, and it gave me so much like looking into different people from different backgrounds and how, it, how they brought ideas to the table and how it affected me and how it affected them. I would like to think it made me a more understanding and well-rounded person, and I got to see through the unbiased eyes of a child what it was like for others who didn't identify with the same characteristics that I identified with. Growing up, it gave me a space to embrace difference. Into high school, that diversity has changed the way I see things and encouraged me to stand with others and to stand up for the other people who are maybe underrepresented and who want a place to be seen. Diversity is probably one of the best learning tools that I have access to, and I think that I'd like to thank the schools for giving me that opportunity. And ev I think that everyone's ideas can be shaped by the things that are around them and by the background that is presented to them and that they have grown up in. And I think bringing all of those ideas to the table and putting them all together is what is going to give us a better rounded and a better uh, fuller experience in education. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker for the night is Marshall Thompson. Welcome, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, thanks to the board, the superintendent, and the cabinet uh, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Marshall Thompson, and I'm a math teacher at Park Center, currently on special assignment as an instructional coach at Osseo Senior High and Maple Grove Senior High. Um, but I'm here because I'm also the Osseo Teachers Lead Negotiator and have been negotiating contracts for over half my career. Tonight, 
you're going to vote on our collective bargaining agreement for 1719. And I'd like to use this opportunity to thank and compliment some of those who are involved in reaching this agreement. The district team of Judy McDonald, Laurel Anderson, Assistant Director of Special Services, Jill Ine, Principals Josie Johnson and Beth Ness, they showed the utmost professionalism throughout. And although we frequently disagreed on a lot of issues, it was always respectful disagreement and it was always coming from a place of seeking understanding. So I really appreciated what the district brought to the table. I also want to compliment our team. I was lucky enough to work with Paul Terry, Melissa Patterson, Gail Carey, Tracy Hahn, our president Kelly Wilson, and field staff Susan Brady. These people are consummate professionals that work really hard to try to balance board priorities, administrative priorities, and also those things that our teachers identified as priorities. But above all of that, they always kept kids front and center and always asked the question, is this what's best for kids? And I really appreciate that in our team. I'm glad that we could come to an agreement. It doesn't always go that way. We don't have to look very far in any direction to find districts that are arguing and places where it's really messy right now. And I know it's kind of a cliche, but we really do have a collaborative culture in this district. And I appreciate it very much. We listen to each other. We work to understand perspectives. I know we're not perfect in Osseo area schools, and there's a lot of room for growth, but there's a lot, also a lot of good that's happening, and we should be really proud of that. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up on our agenda is the superintendent's report. Dr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A regular part of the superintendent's report is to share points <coughs> of pride. Points of pride celebrate students, staff, and community members who are contributing to the accomplishment of our mission, which is to inspire and prepare all students with the confidence, courage, and competence to achieve their dreams, contribute to community, and engage in a lifetime of learning. And I've asked cabinet members to share those points of pride. In the area of achieving dreams, Maple Grove, Osseo, and Park Center Senior High Schools have announced their nominees for the Minnesota State High School League's 2017-18 AAA award program. These students excel in academics, arts, and athletics and will compete with other students statewide for college scholarships. Maple Grove will be represented by Jenna Benson and Christopher Kwan. Osseo will be represented by Darian Clark and Gabrielle Holton, and Park Center will be represented by Rachel Huser and Aaron McMurdo. For the 10th year in a row, Osseo Area Schools had a record number of students earn AP Scholar Recognition from the College Board. Our three comprehensive high schools had a combined total of 103 AP Scholars, 38 AP Scholars with Honor, and 41 AP Scholars with Distinction. Class of 2017 Maple Grove graduates, Alan Concurry, Kevin Wynn, Alyssa Risch, and Sikai Yang, and 20 17 Osseo Senior High grad Jack Ewing earned National AP Scholar Honors. Congratulations to the Osseo Area Schools CI Adapted Soccer Team for its state championship repeat on November 18th. The Pirates were victorious against Chaska to win a third consecutive state title. The PI Adapted Soccer Team also competed at state, placing third after defeating the team from St. Paul Humboldt. In early December, teams of engineers from Osseo area schools competed at the first Lego League and first Tech Challenge tournament at Park, Senior, uh, at Park Center Senior High. Students represented Basswood, Garden City, Palmer Lake, Zanewood, Brooklyn Middle, Osseo Senior, and Maple Grove Senior. These first competitions are part of a global robotics and engineering program. Precious Kennedy, a senior at Maple Grove Senior High, was featured as a CCX News Standout student on December 6th. Kennedy, who excels in advanced placement classes, is described as resilient by her teachers. She is involved with DECA, Model United Nations, and National Honor Society, and has her sights set on majoring in biology. In the category of contributing to community, Kindergartners and second graders at Cedar Island Elementary partnered to create Veterans Day cards for vets at the Maple Grove-based 
Arbor Lake Senior Living Center. Students also made cards for veteran family members of their fellow Cedar Island classmates. Last month, 250 Fair Oaks Elementary students and their siblings received bicycles as part of a donation event sponsored by the nonprofit profit organization Free Bikes for Kids. In addition to receiving the bicycles, each child was also fitted for a helmet to help ensure that they ride safely. A group of third and fifth graders at Basswood Elementary led a successful Stuffed with Love stuffed animal drive in November. These teddy bears are just a few of the items that will be donated to patients at the Minnesota Children's Hospital. In the category of lifelong learning, after a similar event last spring, Zanewood Community School hosted its second Scholar's Choice Day on November 15th. With 30 classes offered throughout the day, students had the opportunity to learn new skills and were exposed to a variety of concepts that support the school's STEAM focus. For the third consecutive year, Osseo Area Schools Community Education is partnering with Stages Theater Company to provide more than 300 students across six elementary schools with the opportunity to hone their acting talents in Alice in Wonderland. Students will perform throughout the years for classmates, staff, families, and community members. Members of Renee Pelton's 2015-2016 third grade class at Parkbrook Elementary are in their third and final year of a partnership with Three Rivers Park District to help redesign the play area at French Regional Park. The students are featured in a recent video from the Three Rivers Park District that describes their involvement with everything from playground logistics to engineering to design. Our next category is mission driven employees. Kate McGuire, superintendent of Osseo Area Schools, was honored with the Rotary Club of Maple Grove's 2017 Business Ethics and Leadership Award on November 18th. In addition, Dr. McGuire received a Rotary International Paul Harris Fellow in recognition of her substantial contribu contributions to humanitarianism and educational service. Elm Creek Elementary is home to many dedicated teachers, including Julie Blue, a first grade teacher who was recognized by WCCO-TV with an Excellent Educator Award on November the 22nd. Mrs. Blue was praised for providing students with hands-on learning opportunities and for keeping parents updated via her weekly Blue Notes blog. Rachel Raz, social worker at Weaver Lake and Rice Lake Elementary Schools, is featured in a new public art installation in downtown St. Paul titled, Speaking of Home. The exhibit has transformed four of St. Paul's public skyways into a monumental public artwork, exploring the meaning of home among first-generation Minnesota immigrants. Family photographs of 58 immigrants and refugees who live in the Twin Cities have been blown up to fill each panel of the Skyway Bridges, turning them into a giant light box. Each is accompanied by text telling the story of the person featured. Last month, staff at Garden City Elementary participated in a Giving of Thanks program where they raised money to help families pay off negative meal debt. In total, staff donated $500 to the cause, enough money to help more than a dozen of the school's families with their negative meal balances. Sarah Schreiner, Spanish teacher at Park Center Senior High, was awarded the Active Learning Center grant from Steelcase, a furniture design company. Through this grant, Schreiner, Schreiner's classroom is now decked out with new tables, chairs, and whiteboards. She also learned instructional techniques to increase student involvement and effectively use the physical space in her lessons. Lastly, Steve Reister, music teacher at Zanewood and Park Brook Elementary Schools, premiered a new compositional work earlier this month based on the African-American spiritual titled Mary Mary. The North Suburban Band, Twin Cities Youth Choral, North Suburban Choral performed the piece and received a standing ovation from the audience. Fernbrook Elementary music teacher Ann Williams directed the children's chorus during the performance. Thank you. Uh, board members, I'd like to introduce a new member of our cabinet team tonight. Anthony Patterness is our new executive director of technology. Anthony comes to us from our friends at Richfield Public Schools, where he was the director of everything, basically. But his <laughs> title was the director of technology. His responsibilities included oversight of information technology, research assessment and evaluation, and data analytics. <coughs> I'm delighted to share that after only five days on the job in Osseo, <laughs> 
Anthony was selected uh, by ties as the Minnesota Technology Leader of the Year. Now I'd like to say <laughs> that was for his five days of work in Osseo area schools, but I cannot. <laughs> it was really for his um, dedication and work and technology leadership in the college. Time before I, know, right? <laughs> I was trying to work it every way I could, every way I could. But it is Do for Dr. His McGuire, how many days ago was that? <laughs> the the recognition. Yeah. Well, he received the recognition this Monday at the Ties Conference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we okay, knew so about so it. So it's been two uh, days. So he's got three more days to step up again. I, right here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think, I think so, too. Yeah, so the pressure's on. Welcome. Uh, so welcome, <laughs> Anthony, to our cabinet team. Thank you. Uh, also, I'd like to highlight some work by the news arm of CCX Media, which is a service of Northwest Community Television, formerly known as Channel 12. CCX Media has taken on a project with really significant scope and benefit for not only our school district, but other neighboring school districts as well. Uh, to feature every school in its viewing area, which includes several school districts. Each of the schools in our district will be highlighted in the CCX Media School Spotlight Series. Several segments featuring our schools have already been broadcast and are available on the CCX Media website and on our district website. And tonight we just want to show you the clip of a recent CCX school highlight for Osseo Area Learning Center. The traditional high school setting doesn't always work for every student. And the Osseo Area Learning Center offers something different. In this week's School Spotlight, the focus is on how this high school works to get students across the finish line. It's kind of chilly out there. Hauke and student management specialist Randy Carter. Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready for this? I think so. Okay. This ritual is symbolic. School staff. All right. Good morning. Literally meet students where they're at each day. Part of what we do every morning, we greet kids at the door. It's a good opportunity to look in a kid's face and see what kind of what kind of day a kid might have. In this and small high school with 200 students, building one-on-one -on -one relationships is the number one priority. Kids are just kids, and you know they've had a variety of experiences for whatever reason that have just not allowed them to be successful in the traditional school setting. And so we really just try hard to make sure that we have an individual plan for each kid and we try and meet them where they're at. The plan right now is to just get work done, work my butt off, and get done as soon as possible. 18-year-old <laughs> Olivia Helwig started at Osseo High School, then tried online school, and last year, she came here. It's really a much smaller school, so there is more opportunity for one-on-one -on -one with the teachers, but it really the teachers just show a lot of uh, support for the students is what I've noticed. She got the encouragement she needed, and Olivia's plans now include graduation. I think that I've realized that I can't be a leader if I can't be a leader for myself. And it's finding ways and figuring out ways to motivate the kids, to challenge kids, and to get them to understand that there are so many opportunities out there that they may or may not be able to see right now. You feeling better today, Cree? So good. Yeah. Now back to that morning meeting and what it really means to meet students where they're at each day. Well, here our classroom size range is 10 to 12, so that may be better for them. Smaller class sizes help and new flexible furniture is another way to engage students in their learning. They can move this around and have more group work type things instead of sitting in a traditional row. Students here may also face a variety of different life situations outside of school. Many students have jobs, some are living with friends, and several students are parents themselves. An on-site daycare ensures their child is safe and being cared for while they take care of their stuff. <laughs> and every Friday, thanks to community partners donating time and resources, small bags of food are given to students for the weekend. At this school, everywhere you look, the message is clear. Keep moving forward. What matters now is that you're right here today. And today we can move forward and do some truly special things. If you buy in, we're going to buy in. Everybody's going to win. Good morning, Matt. Just like the power of that morning ritual, <laughs> when a student earns enough credits to graduate, the whole school celebrates as the graduate walks the halls 
in cap and gown. It's the recognition of a success shared. And the kids all come out and the teachers come out and we all ring bells and it's a big fun thing, but it really celebrates that success. That's a big milestone for our kids. And graduating students at Osseo Area Learning Center also take part in a more traditional com commencement ceremony as well. Are doing such a great job for each of our schools, really telling the story about the school and the school culture. We're so appreciative of their work. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've been watching this kid take to the really, really well made. When we did Birch Grove, my own kid got her one and a half seconds of fame in that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Recognize the back of her head. <laughs> Next up on our agenda are school board reports. Our first school board report is a November 16th and November 20th work session report. Uh, Director Ostafi. Thank you, Chair Gerhardt. The school board work sessions on November 16th and November 20th focused on the superintendent search. November 16th, representatives from Rain Associates, School Exec Connect, and the Minnesota School Boards Association presented their proposals for leading the superintendent search. After considering all presentations, board members selected Ray and Associates to lead the superintendent search. November 20th, Ray and Associates uh, was invited back to officially kick off the firm's work with the school board. A representative of the firm reviewed a tentative timeline, described some of the tools available for use, identified staff contacts for very aspects of the, various aspects of the process, and answered questions from board members. Uh, board members set another meeting to continue work on the superintendent search. That meeting would take place on Tuesday, December 19th at 6 p.m. at the Educational Service Center. That is next Tuesday right here. And all school board work sessions are open to the public and are audio taped and put on the website. Work sessions that focus solely on the superintendent search are also video recorded. Uh, members of the public can access recordings of the work sessions on the district website. Thank you. Next up is a November 20th, 2017 Policy Committee Report. Director Bouvet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, the School Board Policy Committee met here at the Educational Service Center at 6 p.m. on Monday, November 20th. Board members Bob Gerhardt and myself, Jim Bouvet, attended. Superintendent Kate McGuire, General Counsel Tim Palmatier also attended. The committee discussed additional changes to the web and intranet publishing policy, policy 925, the committee approved policy language clarifying that accessibility to district websites for persons with visual, print, or other disabilities will be maintained through compliance with standard accessibility measures that audit website accessibility for disabled persons, such as the WAVE tool. The committee approved the revised policy for first reading at tonight's board meeting. <coughs> the committee discussed proposed revisions to the student chemical use policy, policy number 541, the policy discussed whether revisions to the policy were needed or appropriate in light of recent changes to state law related to medical cannabis. The committee determined that no additional language in the policy was needed in connection to the changes in state law. The committee reviewed and approved other minor edits to the proposed policy and approved the policy for first reading at tonight's board meeting. The committee reviewed additional proposed changes to its drug-free workplace policy, policy number 418, in connection to the changes in state law related to medical cannabis. In order to remain in compliance with the Federal Drug-Free Workplace Act, which prohibits use of Schedule I drugs by employees of federal grant recipients, the committee agreed to language changes clarifying that use of medical cannabis was not permitted within the workplace. However, the committee further agreed that enforcement provisions should take into account circumstances where an employee has violated the policy but has been lawfully prescribed medical cannabis. The committee approved the policy for first reading at tonight's board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is a December 5th, 2017 work session report. Director Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The school board discussed the 2018 draft legislative platform at the December 5th, 2017 work session. Board members received an update that included an overview of one, the work of the district's lobbying <coughs> consultant, Evo Consulting, two, key changes resulting from the 2017 legislative session, three, the outlook for the 2018 legislative session, and four, the Minnesota Management and Budget November 2017 Budget and Economic for Forecast. Board members reviewed a draft of district le legislative platform items and discussed other items for potential consideration. Staff and board members will pay close attention to the platform items proposed by state educational organizations in the coming weeks. 
The final 2018 legislative platform will be accepted by the school board at its January 16th, 2018 regular school board meeting in preparation for the start of the legislative session. The final portion of the work session was utilized to discuss other items of interest, including an, updated re an update regarding the Minnesota School Trust lands and an update from staff regarding the development of foundational racial equity training. All school board work sessions are open to the public and are also audio taped. Members of the public can access audio recordings of work sessions on our district website. Thank you. Board members, do you have any other reports? Mr. Chair? Yes. I have a TIES report. Um, basically, this was from October 18th, so it's a little older. Just to refresh everyone's memory, TIES is a joint powers board established in 1967 that includes ISD 279 Osseo Area Schools as one of 48 owner school districts. TIES provides technology services that include the new EduPoint Synergy Student Information System, eFinance Plus HR Payroll Finance System, the fee pay system, TIES Ed Professional Development, and more. I'm the representative for Osseo Area Schools on the TIES governing board called the Executive Committee. On October 18th, the monthly meeting of the TIES Executive Committee met to discuss several topics. The, the current financial situation, loss of expected revenue, and the obligations that must be met. Uh, to meet these obligations, in the near term, a $7 per student fee for 2017-18 is being shared among all owners. For Osseo, this is unfortunately approximately $144,000. A special superintendent meeting is being, was held on Friday, November 10th to discuss business challenges, alternatives, and implications. A proposed resolution defining an orderly dissolution process was discussed. And if a m majority of the owners were to vote on dissolving the current joint powers board, a group of owners could elect to reform under a new agreement with a new set of bylaws. In any case, the future must decide, must include a requirement to provide ongoing support for districts for a two year transition period. Uh, I just wanted to also say that we need to keep our eyes on this and I'm, and since I'm a representative on the executive committee, I'm uh, involved in monitoring the situation. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I know that I almost forgot about that report, so thanks for putting that in there, it's important stuff. Uh, any other reports? Um, I have just a quick one, not a formal report. They didn't, I didn't write up a formal report for this, but earlier today I got a chance to spend an hour over at uh, our good partners at Boston Scientific uh, to see a portion of their Season of Giving event, which uh, through the great generosity of, of the Boston Sci employees allows them to play Secret Santa to nominated uh, families in need within our district and give toys and household goods and things like that and, and distribute them anonymously through through some of our volunteers to uh, help during the, the holiday season. I'm kind of hoping we'd have pictures and things like that maybe for next month's superintendent report, but given that we're in the height of the season, I wanted to mention that right now and, and put a shout out to the, uh, the generosity of all the employees and, and the, uh, the hard work of the volunteers that are involved in, in making this happen. So next up on our agenda is presentation, enrollment trends and projections for the next five years, Patricia Magnuson. projections. Enrollment trends are reviewed annually at this time of the year in order to project enrollment for next fiscal year and to make new five-year enrollment projections. The purpose of tonight's presentation is to provide an overview of enrollment trends used in making five-year enrollment projections. These projections are important for decision making regarding budget and staffing for the upcoming school year. This is the framework for the Enrollment and Capacity Management Advisory Committee. This fall, the committee has reviewed enrollment data and, vari and variances from projection and provided observations and feedback. As our framework suggests, this, feed this feedback will be an important part of recommendations created by the ECMAT. This first chart shows Osseo Area Schools K-12 fall enrollment over the last five years. This fall's enrollment of 20,541 marks the third consecutive year of enrollment growth for Osseo Area Schools. At 1.49% over last year, 
This falls enrollment growth rate is the largest the district has experienced in these three years of growth. Overall, enrollment for fiscal year 2018 is greater than fiscal year 2017 by 301 students, following an increase of 141 and 89 students in the last two years. This chart shows Osseo Area Schools fall enrollment over the last five years for elementary and secondary grade spans. The red line shows students served in secondary grades 6 through 12. Note that the grades served in this chart were adjusted for consistency and analysis to reflect the change in grade spans that began in fiscal year 2016. And then the blue line shows the number of students served in elementary grades K through 5. An analysis of our five-year historical trend is a key component in projecting future enrollment. Over the past several years, we have seen enrollment stabilize and grow. We continue to experience an increase in secondary enrollment, which correlates to the change to 9th through 12th grade high schools. Elementary enrollment stabilized last fall, following a couple of years of decline related to charter school enrollments. This fall, we are experiencing, experiencing an increase in elementary enrollment for the first time in the last five years. Minnesota has an enrollment options program often referred to as open enrollment. Families can make choices to enroll their students in public schools that are not in the school district in which they reside. Osseo Area Schools has consistently enrolled around 1,300 students from other Minnesota school districts. In recent years, this number has begun to approach 1,400 and has consistently represented over 6% of total school district enrollment. The majority of these students come from Anoka Hennepin, Robbinsdale, Minneapolis, and Brooklyn Center. In addition to students coming into Osseo Area Schools from other public options, school choice means that some of Osseo Area Schools resident students choose options outside of the district. Please note that the fiscal year 2018 data is preliminary because it reflects November 2017 information and not year-end data. Information regarding non-public or private school students is an especially early estimate. Preliminary data suggests a slight increase in the population of private school students, which includes homeschooled students of about 105 students to a total of 1,683. For the first time in several years, preliminary data indicates a decline in the number of students choosing a public option other than Osseo Area Schools, with a decline of 293 to 5,875. And charter school enrollment has grown by about 118 students to 3,202. And finally, residents choosing to attend Osseo Area Schools grew by 316 students to 19,162. In looking at those families who choose a public school option for their children, nearly 77% of our resident students who attend a public school option are choosing Osseo Area Schools. This can often be referred to as the resident capture rate. So for Osseo Area Schools in fiscal year 2018, we estimate that we are capturing 76.53% of students whose family chooses a public school option for their child. And this is up just slightly from 75.34% last year. The next couple of slides will provide a bit more detail about specific public school options. This slide contains a list of all Minnesota school districts that enroll more than 50 of Osseo Area Schools resident students. Because choice can go both ways, the last three columns shows the net gain or loss for Osseo for the last three years. For example, by subtracting the number of Anoka resident students choosing to attend here at Osseo Area Schools, which is 427, from the number of Osseo Area Schools residents choosing to attend at Anoka, which is 942, we see a net loss of 515 students from Osseo Area Schools to Anoka. Early data indicates a decline in the net loss of resident students to Anoka, Brooklyn Center, and Wyzetta. 
Osseo gains more students than we lose from Robbinsdale and Minneapolis school districts. This slide shows the 11 charter schools that have enrolled more than 50 Osseo area schools resident students for the 2017-18 school year. Beacon Academy moved to Crystal this fall and Odyssey closed this fall. Enrollment of Osseo area school students at several other charter schools is growing. In the spring of 2016, Osseo area schools conducted a survey to learn more about school choice decisions, including the reasons that parents are choosing other public school options. The major findings are indicated in the next few slides. This first slide isolates families who choose other public school, district, school districts. We found that the majority of the time students moved <coughs> for reasons not related to the school. For example, the family moved out of their former district and wanted to remain enrolled there. We also found that about one third of respondents indicated that the move was related to general academics and curriculum. This slide isolates families who chose a public charter school. We found that the majority of the time, students enrolled for reasons related to general academics and curriculum. We also found that about one fourth of respondents indicated that the move was related to non-academic reasons. We've taken action in several areas that reflect what we learned through the school choice survey. For example, our investment in targeted class size reductions in kindergarten through third grade support our family's interest in lower class sizes. The survey findings played an important role in our work last year to define a clearer Osseo Area Schools brand. Two of our brand promises, opportunity and support, came directly from the school choice survey. The findings are also being used to strengthen our enrollment marketing efforts with the goal of retaining more of our own resident students in Osseo area schools. All of the trend information is used to estimate our five-year enrollment projections. The yellow highlighted columns indicate our current projected enrollments for the next five years based upon current patterns of growth. I'm just going to point out some um, items of interest. Overall, our historical data shows the growth trend in the past few years, which I talked about a little bit earlier. And then at the top, you can see that Hennepin County birth data from five years prior is used to project our kindergarten enrollment. Births were up for the year that will produce next year's kindergarten class. Kindergarten through fifth grade cohort size has had a downward trend for the past few years, presumably due to the draw of public charter schools. This past year, however, elementary enrollment has grown due to lower open enrollments out and a growing resident population. Both of our secondary cohorts at middle and high school level are either stable or growing. Grade nine enrollment is 1,656 this fall. This is up over 200 students from the size of this class last year when they were in eighth grade where they were 1,450 students. Due to the increase in enrollment at ninth grade, this grade is projected to become one of the largest cohort sizes in the district. And you can look at all those numbers in the history and the district has not seen classes of over 1,700 students since the graduating classes in 2011 and 2012. Lastly, overall student population is up from last year, which is appearing to become a trend for Osseo area schools. This was not forecasted a few years ago. Our early projections for next fall increase and in, um, indicate another increase in overall enrollment of 215 students. This chart depicts that same data in a trend line. It shows that as the larger grade levels at ninth grade move their way through the secondary system, secondary enrollment could continue to grow over the next five years. Elementary enrollment appears to be stabilizing over the next five years. In this chart, elementary is in blue and secondary is in red. Overall, enrollment continues to grow over the 10 year span depicted here to a total of 21,285 students in fiscal year 2023. 
Over the coming weeks, we will finalize grade level and site level enrollment projections for fiscal year 2019. These projections will be used to prepare revenue budgets and staffing allocations and will, and will inform facility planning for next year. As we continue to study housing development trends over the coming months, we expect that enrollment projections for later portions of the next five years will change. We will monitor these trends carefully as we examine the data with the Enrollment and Capacity Management Advisory Committee. Thank you very much. And are Thank there you. any questions? Um, I have one. Uh, back in the middle of the presentation, you had uh, the comparison of the charter schools mm -hmm. and how many students that they are they're capturing. And I saw that you know, Parnassus has, has a pretty big jump from year to year there. Are they completely built out grade-wise? Yeah. This year they added 12th grade, and I did call over there and verify that. Okay, so, okay. So, so now they, they're done. Okay, so I mean we probably won't see class size right. jumps in the future because they're they're at their That's right, that, n capacity. that number has been jumping yeah. as they add grades. Yeah. Right, okay. Thank uh, you, good clarification. I mean the classes that are there now were about 25 to 50. They are planning to do up to 75 to 100. Right. The, the ones that are graduating now were much smaller when they started. So there's probably, there is going to be room for another one to sure. 200 students to fill that out over the next couple sure. of years. So I wouldn't say we're out of, you know, they're still competing and they're still. It, it, it will level out. Yes. Yep. Okay. It, it's not a matter of adding More the 12th grades. grade, adding the 11th grade. It's right. the class size. But the size fifth, sixth, seventh graders are twice the size of the current right. 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I do have a, uh, a question uh, or, or a comment. So 29,912 students reside in the borders of this district and 19,162 attend. So 10,750 or 36% of the students choose to go elsewhere. 64% capture rate of all students making the decision of where they want to be educated or their parents making that decision. So. One out of three we lose. Uh, that's a significant number. And we talk about in, in three, you know, three bullet points, uh, general academics and curriculum and non-academic reasons, discipline, safety, and class size. And, and we list three things that they're doing. And I know we're doing a lot more. But branding and marketing doesn't address curriculum and it doesn't address behavior and it doesn't address class size. We have one thing that says class size. But if all we're doing is branding and marketing and not addressing the curriculum and the behavior, the safety issues, we are leaving a lot of students out in the cold, forcing them to go elsewhere, and leaving a lot of money on the table. So, uh, you know, th there's other things that need to be addressed, and this isn't the time to go into that in-depth discussion, because I know we're doing more things than branding and marketing, but we have to, uh, you know, maybe sit down and have a work session specifically around the issues that we've attempted to do, have they been successful, and let's talk about other curriculum ideas, uh, giving uh, you know, certain schools uh, greater choice uh, of, of HP courses, doing more work with hands-on uh, trades and skills, uh, that those jobs are out there and we don't have the people to fulfill them. You know, there's a lot of opportunity to, to improve, and when a third of your potential customers go elsewhere, uh, competition's telling you something. So uh, th that's just one of the things I wanted to, to mention. Thank you. Board members, any other comments? I just had one. It's not really directed, it's not really a question for you, Patricia. It's more of a comment directed to ourselves. Um, you know, just, I know there's a lot of work going on with enrollment and capacity. I know that, you know, there's, Tons of effort going on with that. I know that we took a little bit of a step back on that front to reevaluate and make sure that we had the, you know, all of our facts straight before moving forward with, with some of those studies. But on the flip side of that, I bumped into one of our principals today and he you know, gave me a reminder that we have buildings that are tight right now. It's an ongoing problem and you know, while we sit and study things, the problem continues. So I would, I'm directing this comment to ourselves to you know, keep a little fire under our feet to, to make sure that, you know, we're going to do our best to take action on these things and then try to alleviate some of these, uh, some of these bottlenecks that we have. So. Thank you.
Next up on our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, board members, are there any items on the consent agenda that you would like to pull off for separate consideration? Hearing none, I would move to accept the consent agenda as presented. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Fortner. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? With that, the consent agenda passes 6 0. Next up on our agenda are action items. Uh, first action item tonight is approval of 2017 payable 2018 levy limitation certification. Patricia Magnuson. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, I recommend approval of the 2018 tax levy as presented early this evening. Okay. Uh, board members, any questions? All right, with that, I would move that we approve the 2017 payable 2018 levy limitation certification. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Ostafi. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay, we had 4-2. Uh, okay. Next up on our action items, actually we have several uh, items pertaining to contracts. And Judy, I believe you wanted to just address them somewhat as a group and then we'll go through and, and move and vote on them separately. Yes, thank you, Chair Gerhardt, and good evening, school board members and Superintendent McGuire. On the agenda this evening for school board action are recommendations for approval for five employee group contracts comprised of directors, confidential managers, principals, salaried professionals, school executives, and teachers. The contracts you will, be, you will be considering this evening include approximately 100 employees who serve in administrative positions throughout the district and 1,700 employees serving in positions who deliver the highest quality direct instruction and support to our students. All of these agreements expired on June 30, 2017, and the new agreements contain language changes that reflect current district practices, as well as additional provisions that serve to support our district mission and strategic priorities. School board members have had the opportunity to review the proposed changes to the provisions contained in the terms and conditions, to ask questions, dialogue about the new provisions, and to consider financial implications. The new contract provisions fall within the financial parameters set by the board for the 2017-19 contract term, and it is the superintendent's recommendation that you approve the five employee contracts presented to you this evening. Thank you. Are there anything about individual contracts that, that you would like to co comment on or shall we just move to, to the vote? Um, one thing I would like to thank, uh, also thank uh, our uh, Education Minnesota negotiations team and thank you to Marshall for uh, those kind words about the uh, negotiations experience itself. Although we certainly disagreed, I, I would affirm that. We also were uh, highly professional and all of us w had our focus on what's best for students. So thank you, Marshall and the EMO negotiations team. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I would move uh, that we recommend for approval the agreement and the terms and conditions of employment between the Independent School District 279 Board and Directors and Confidential Managers for July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2019. Do we have a second? Second by uh, Director Doug, or yeah, <laughs> Director Douglas. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? With that, the contract for directors and confidential managers passes 6-0. Next up, I would move that we recommend or we approve uh, the agreement on the terms and conditions for employment between the Independent School District 279 Board and principals effective July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2019. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Fortner. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And with that, the principals contract is approved 6-0. Next up, I would move that we uh, approve the agreement on terms and conditions of employment between the Independent School District 279 Board and salaried professionals effective July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2019. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Douglas. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And with that, the salaried professionals contract is approved 6-0. Next up, I would move that we Approve the agreement on terms and conditions of employment between Independent School District 279 School Board and school executives effective July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2019. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Douglas. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And with that, the school executives contract is approved 
Next up, I would move that we agree on the terms and conditions of employment between Independent School District 279 School Board and teachers effective July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2019. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Douglas. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. And the teacher's contract is passed on a vote of five to one. Next up on the action items are gifts to the district in a total of $30,095.13. I would move that we accept these gifts. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Fortner. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And with that, we graciously accept gifts to the district totaling $30,095.13. Uh, next up uh, are informational items. Uh, first reading of policy 418, the drug-free workplace. Thank you, Chairman uh, Gerhardt, school board members, and Superintendent McGuire. Uh, as board member, or forget reported earlier in this meeting, there are three policies on the agenda for first read tonight. The first policy is policy 418, drug-free workplace. The amended policy is required by law. The proposed policy is revised to address differences between federal law, which specifically prohibit the use of cannabis as a Schedule I drug by employees of federal grant recipients, and the Minnesota Medical Cannabis Law. To ensure compliance with federal mandates, the proposed policy clarifies that the use of medical can cannabis is not permitted within the workplace, but also recognizes that enforcement provisions should take into account circumstances where an employee has lawfully prescribed medical cannabis under Minnesota law. All right, thank you. Next up is first reading of policy 541, students, chemical use and abuse. Again, thank you. Uh, policy uh, 541, chemical use and abuse, is a policy directed at uh, students within the district. The amended policy is not specifically required by state or federal law, but it has been board policy since 1981. The policy was last revised in June of 2009. The amendments to this policy are largely related to formatting. The only substantive proposed change is a requirement that students uh, reflecting what the state law actually does reflect, students uh, suspected of drug or chemical abuse be referred to their school assistance team. Thank you. And next, first reading of policy 925, web and intranet publishing. And finally, policy 925, um, the amended policy is not required by state or federal law. The policy was revised in January of 2016. The proposed policy has been modified to reflect that district websites should be accessible to individuals with disabilities by meeting compliance expectations of standard website accessibility evaluation measures. The policy has also been revised and reformatted to reflect current district policy formatting standards. Uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, note that uh, first reading begins the four-week period for reaction to proposed policy changes by concerned groups or individuals. After the four-week period, the school board may adopt a policy after a second reading. The proposed policies are available on, school on the school district's website with the agenda for this meeting. Comments may be directed to the school board or myself. Uh, comments on the policy or policies may also be provided online from the school board policies and procedures website on the district's website. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Next up are announcements. A school board work session will be held on Tuesday, December 19th, 2017 at 6 p.m. in the boardroom at the ESC. The topic will be superintendent search. This meeting will be open to the public. The school board organizational meeting will be held on Tuesday, January 9th, 2018 at 6 p.m. in the boardroom at the ESC. This meeting will be open to the public. A school board work session will be held on Tuesday, January 9th, 2018 at 6.15 p.m. in the forum room at the ESC. The topics will be world's best workforce, priority goal updates, customer service, and digital learning for all. This meeting will be open to the public. A regular school board meeting will be held on Tuesday, January 16th, 2018 at 6 p.m in the boardroom at the ESC. This meeting will be open to the public. And a negotiation strategies meeting will be held on Tuesday, January 16th, 2018 at 7 p.m. in room N10 at the ESC. This meeting will be closed to the public. That brings us to the end of our agenda. I would um, move to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Craig. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And with that, we are adjourned at 7.41 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.